Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. What's new and exciting in your world this week? Competition is new and exciting in my world. That is neither new nor exciting. I'm excited about it, James. I have so many jokes to say right at that moment (laughs) that I don't even know where to begin. One of our listeners wrote me this week and started off with, why is James so rude to you? (laughs) I love it how you just say, one of our listeners wrote to me as if I didn't also get that email. I said, it's just his way. You set up this system (laughs) wherein people could email us at a words and numbers podcast at Gmail because it wasn't long enough just to say words and numbers at gmail.com. You had to go that one extra word to get it even longer. And then you set it up to automatically forward to me. (laughs) That was the best part. Which I have absolutely no control over. And then a bunch of out there subscribed us to every mailing list on on God's green earth. So I get these emails every day (laughs) to words and numbers, all because you can't help it. And then some guy writes and says, why is James Rude to you? You've got to be kidding me. This, ladies and gentlemen, has become my hobby in life. You just throw something out there for James to be mad about and watch him go. (laughs) I'm putting his mad face in the show notes. <laughs> you can all see James being angry. <laughs> There's only one constant in that story you just told. Yes? It's you. <laughs> anyway. I want to talk about competition. The town I grew up in when I was young, I can recall the beginning of the big boom across America of building shopping malls. There was a mall that was going up in the next town over and everybody was complaining about it's going to take business away from the downtown and downtown is going to be gutted. And the fact of the matter is downtown was a horrible retail experience. Parking was pretty much non-existent. The parking that was there, you had to pay for the privilege of parking so you can shop downtown. Retail workers were surly. Selection was limited. So the mall opens up. And the mall is beautiful. Tons of parking. People there were wonderful. Lots of selection. Anyway, fast forward about 20, 30 years. And the downtown upped its game. It upped its game so much that there are outdoor cafes, plenty of free parking, things to do. And what happened to the mall? Out of business. Last week it closed. As has happened across the entire country. And this is my story of competition. Competition is far richer than simply one business putting another business out of business. It's about businesses constantly looking for what they can do to make the experience better for the customers, to give the customers what they want. And if you don't have competition, you don't have that force. And so you get the surly downtown workers with the no parking that we had when I was a child. All it took was that competition of the mall. And it completely turned around the downtown. Now, it took some time, mind you, but it happened. But the fantastic question is, what comes next right. to put downtown back on the ropes? Because that's going to happen. Yep. You just don't know how it's going to happen. And when everybody lost their minds about online retail and how that was going to do in all kinds of local retail shops, it did. But then the exact thing you mentioned is the interesting thing, cafes. What do people want? They want to go out and have a nice casual meal. They want to maybe sit outside when it's nice. Food trucks come to mind immediately too, right? This brand new thing that we didn't really have much of. I mean, food trucks when you and I were kids were the coffee truck that would sit outside of a factory. Guys on break at the factory would come out, get a cup of coffee and a bear claw, that kind of thing. Now you can go get a Michelin star meal at a food truck. There are these interesting things that come out of left field that you're just not expecting. In that spirit, I have no idea what's coming next, but it's real interesting to wonder what it's going to be. And again, we have the beauty of competition. As long as you have an environment in which competition is possible, you've got entrepreneurs thinking about the question you just asked. What's next? What can I do to make customers want my product so badly that they come out of their houses and give me their money? There was an episode of Cheers, and Sam Malone needed a lot of money real fast. And he sat back and he said, all I have to do is invent something that nobody thinks they need yet. 
<laughs> right. I swear to God, Steve Jobs must have been watching that TV show because he said the same thing years later in all seriousness. That went from comedy to reality in the space of 10 years. It's the law of large numbers. It's luck. It's a little bit of skill. It's imagination all thrown into a pot. And there's probably 100,000 people out there with all kinds of great ideas. I just don't know which one's going to be the winning idea. I wouldn't have guessed food trucks and cafes. If I had guessed those things, I would have opened a cafe or a food truck. And this is why you can't plan economies. It's just not possible to guess what people want. Now, some entrepreneurs get it right, but they get it right in part by random chance that you've got lots of them trying lots of different things. And so many more of them get it wrong. Yeah, you don't see the ones that get it wrong. That's right. They come and go so fast, they're barely a blip on the radar screen, but so many more get it wrong. The idea that you can plan anything like an economy is the ultimate hubris. TSA is testing facial recognition at more airports now. Quote, raising privacy concerns, the AP tells us. If you're talking about privacy concerns with the TSA, you have already missed the boat very, very badly. This is the kind of world that only science fiction movies foresaw 20, 30 years ago. All of a sudden, you're going to have to look at the camera to do anything. It's going to be a pretty small step to go from facial recognition to get on an airplane to facial recognition to buy something. Do you want that to happen? I submit that a lot of people are going to say no, but they're going to behave yes. We're going to have a brave new world as a result of this sort of technology. And it's not going to be because the TSA did it. It's going to be because Walmart did it. Yeah, we voluntarily said, yes, let's do this thing. That's right. I remember when the first Amazon stores opened and you could tap your credit card on the way out the door. And then they open those things up at the airport and I can get my much beloved Coke Zero without talking to a person. And boy, that does sound better than having to talk to a person. And I think there's a big difference between the government doing it and private business doing it. Because with private business, we are constantly holding them accountable. If Walmart does something like this and turns around and starts selling our facial recognition data, we stop shopping at Walmart. We talk about wanting to safeguard our privacy and how we'd never let that happen. Well, of course we're going to let that happen. We don't give a second thought to our privacy. There's always a trade-off we're willing to make. I'm less willing to make those trade-offs than some, but admittedly more willing than others. I just want to get this one on the table as a future foolishness of the week. Which brings us to the present foolishness of the week. I'm going to give you the headline from the Wall Street Journal. Chocolate milk faces potential ban in school cafeterias. Seriously? Now the federal government is going to weasel its way into chocolate milk. Kids aren't fat because of chocolate milk. They were drinking chocolate milk back in the 50s. That's right. When they were drinking chocolate milk 40 years ago, nobody was obese. Whatever the obesity problem is, it was triggered by something that is not chocolate milk. If people said, you know what, this is ridiculous, knock it off. But the federal government will not stop until you make it. For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. We recorded this live episode of Words and Numbers at Sandy High School in Sandy, Oregon, where we spent the day giving lectures on economics and government. If you're interested in having us come to your high school or college, contact us at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. We started doing a podcast five, six years ago. It was Ant's idea. I thought it was the dumbest idea he had ever had. <laughs> and I told him as much, and he said, no, no, we have to do it. And he nagged at me long enough that I just said, okay. One thing led to another, and now we have over a million downloads, and it came to be the one thing that we do that kind of defines everything else we do. We're in the top 1% of podcasts in the world. Well... Don't get too excited because there's a lot of crappy podcasts. 90% of the podcasts in the world have three episodes recorded right. in some dude's mother's basement. So right. we try not to get big headed about this, but it is pretty cool. And we end up getting invited lots of places because of it. You know, we've met like a lot of really interesting and nice people that we would never have met otherwise. Once in a while, we do these words and numbers, we call it words and numbers live in front of a live audience, which 
it's usually high school students. It's always our favorite to do this. It's way more fun. But if you want to find us, we're on all the podcast players and YouTube. We want to talk today about why you should vote or why you shouldn't vote. And we're going to offer, at least I'm going to offer some arguments on both sides. James is going to offer you arguments on one of them. Well, should you really vote? The answer you're supposed to give is yes, and you're supposed to want to get that stupid sticker that they give you. However, and trust me when I tell you, your one vote is never going to be the difference maker. It's never going to happen that you go to vote for anything at the federal level, maybe on a local office, maybe. But, at, you know, your House of Representatives, the Senate, the President, that one vote that you cast will literally never make the difference. So the obvious question is, if you know it's not going to make a difference, why would you bother? And there might be good reasons for that. And I will tell you that I actually vote more often than not, even with this terrible attitude that I have about it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I I tend to as well. Yeah, but, you know, the comeback to that of, well, one vote won't matter. The comeback that I often hear is, yeah, but if everybody said that. Well, yeah, but everybody doesn't say that. Well, that's the point. The decision in front of you is about you. It's not about everybody. This is your mother saying And if everybody else jumped off a bridge, would you also? And, you know, ease up on me, Ma. That's not how it works here in my life. One of the problems I have with voting, we seem to be fixated as Americans about voting in democracy as if this is the cure to all our ills. Leaves me wondering what's so magical about a majority? You know, we say, well, if 50% of the people say this or 51% of the people say this, this should be the answer. Well, here... Why 51? Let me help you with an answer here. Roughly half of the American people said, Joe Biden. And four years before that, the same roughly 50% said, Donald Trump. Yeah, except it's not 50%. No, it's... Because this is one of the things people say. Well, we all got together and we said, this is our president. The majority said, you know, this... The fact is, only about half of eligible Americans vote. And if the winner wins, as typically happens, by 50% plus a little bit, this is not the person that 50% of us voted for. It's the person that 25% of us voted for. Yeah, and and even you know that's cheap observation, because if the other 50% had voted, there's every indication they would have voted exactly the same way. We get a good representative sample, and that's good enough. We were talking about this the other night. It might shock you to know how small a representative sample could be. Yes. And see, this is the thing. Politicians will say every vote should count. Everybody get out there and vote. Look, I'm a statistician. I can tell you the numbers here. The last election, so between Biden and Trump, 160 million Americans voted. And given how that broke, and I forget what the percentages were, 54 Biden, 46 Trump, whatever it was. But... To get that same outcome, we didn't need to ask 160 million voters. All you had to ask was 10,000, provided you selected them randomly. If we'd selected randomly 10,000 eligible voters and said, who do you want, Trump, Biden, 99% of the time you'd get the exact same answer as you get when we ask all 160 million. So there's no reason for each of our votes to count. All you need is a few thousand. You've got the answer. It would be way cheaper to do it that way. It would be way cheaper. But here's the thing. The key is, I said, if you select them randomly. And this is what politicians don't want. And if you go back to, you may not even have been born then, the very close election, Gore Oh, God, of course they weren't weren't born then. That was in 2000, for God's sake. (laughs) Yeah, I guess not, yeah. (laughs) Gore and Bush the second, where it was literally, it was coming down to like this particular county in Florida, right? 12 votes in Florida. You had both of them were doing it. Bush was saying every vote should count. And the military votes aren't in yet from overseas. We have to wait till those come in because every American should have a say. And Gore similarly said every vote should count. And there are these counties in Florida that haven't been counted correctly. These should be counted because every vote should count. What were they doing? Overseas votes are typically military and they typically break Republican. In Gore, when he was pointing to these counties, they were counties that were heavily Democrat. They were not saying every vote should count. They were saying these particular votes that tend to go to me, they should count. In fact, if you select them randomly, you only need 10,000 people. That's it. That's actually a big random sample. Yeah. Most things, you don't need it even close to that big. So, you know, I think most people who are educated in statistics would just say, yeah, that sounds right. You're the statistician, I'm not. But I wouldn't argue with that, given my graduate school training in statistics. That seems exactly right. 
If we can do that, if we can know exactly what the American people want some other way, is there some magic about voting that I'm unaware of? Does it make a difference that every two years I get in my car and drive to the fire station and get in a long line and people hand me a beverage and other people yell at me and then they put a sticker on you and you leave? Is that magical somehow? Does it matter? We were talking about this in the car on the way down here. And I can make a psychological argument, maybe, that goes along these lines. If we all get out and vote, and I convince you, look, go out and vote. And statistically, your vote matters absolutely not. It does not matter. But it's possible that something psychological happens, that you feel engaged. And in feeling engaged, you may in the future pay more attention to what's going on. And maybe you'll actually get out and you'll know, volunteer for some civic stuff or something. You become more part of the civic process, maybe. I mean, there's a strange thing that happens, right? We all get exercised thinking about the president. Mm. And that's what we all go to vote for, right? When presidential elections, the voting rates are much, much higher. And then you vote for senators and representatives. And then a layer down, you vote for governors and state reps and state senators and what have you. And as you go down the levels, your vote actually matters a lot more. When you get down to the lowest level, one or two votes can, in fact, swing those elections. Right, yeah, where a thousand people show up. Or a hundred. Yeah, right, right. And nobody bothers to vote in those. Right. And who has the most control over you? Is it going to be the president of the United States, your senators? Actually, it's going to be the zoning board, wherever you end up buying property. It's going to be those people. People have a direct say in what you do every day. The HOA that I live under has way more control over me than any president ever will. HOA is Homeowners Association. And I hate them. <laughs> I do. I hate them. One day they came over to my house and they said, oh, you have to paint your house. And I said, why? And they went, could look better. That was the official statement. So I didn't, the way you don't. And they sent me an email a year later saying, we're here to help. And I said, great. The painter wants $12,000. When can I expect the check? They wrote back and said, no, we're not giving you the money. We're just here to help. I said, with what exactly? <laughs> These people can sit on top of me. Hmm. If I don't paint that house in a timely manner, they'll slap a lien on it. And if I ever sell the house, they'll get money before I will. Right. That house will actually technically become more theirs than mine. And the interesting thing is, and I agree with James entirely, we tend not to notice this, that the local government impacts your lives much more. Not only do we tend not to vote in local elections, we tend to not even know who's running. That's right. That's the people right. who have most influence politically over my life, I don't even know what their names are. And look, when I was your age, I had any number of run-ins with the local government. We called them the police, mm -hmm. right? That's local government. They had more control over me then and now than anybody at the federal level. A local cop can make my life a living hell tomorrow. Why? Because it feels like it. And this is why it's actually kind of important to vote for jobs like sheriff, because that's a check on that sort of behavior. And that has a lot more to do with your day-to-day -day life than a sitting president ever will. But notice something interesting. To do that, if you're gonna take it seriously, you're gonna go vote in local elections, you gotta do some homework. You gotta go find out yeah. who's running, what the difference between them is, what they stand for, all this stuff. Except you should be doing that at the federal level when you vote as well. And we think that we do it, but we're actually not. What we're really doing at the federal level is voting on the basis of charisma or looks or, you know, this guy, I like his tie better. We don't admit that to ourselves, but that's what we do. And I can give you evidence. Well, it's overwhelming. The tall guy almost always wins. Right. Well, what was Nixon and Kennedy? The yeah. first televised the debate? The first televised debate, that's right. Kennedy had makeup on and looked better on camera. Nixon did too, but he had a bad back and he broke into a horrible sweat and it all leaked down his face. Right, yeah, yeah. He looked terrible. And that threw when people were polled to say who won the debate. It went Kennedy in a landslide. Kennedy. Right, yeah. Except people who listened to it on the radio. Nixon in a landslide. Really? Those that didn't see him. And that goes to this social experiment. You can find this on YouTube. This guy goes to college campuses and he says, I'm doing polling. What's your attitude toward these two presidential contenders? One was Obama and the other one was, I forget who it was. Who ran against Obama? It wasn't Bush. Bush did too. There were a couple of guys. Doesn't really matter. Whoever it was, but the two candidates. And what the guy says is, here's the platform of the Democratic candidate. 
what do you think about this? Yes, no, whatever. And of course, the students who identified as Democrats said this is great. The ones who identified as Republicans said this is horrible. And then he shows him the other candidate. Here's the other candidate with the platform. This is the Republican. And students who identified as Republicans said, yeah, that guy's great. His platform is absolutely right. And the students who identified as Democrats said no. And then the punchline of the social experiment comes out that the guy had switched the names. The Democratic name was appearing above the Republican platform. The Republican name was appearing above the Democratic platform. And what had happened was the students saw the name. They claimed and they probably believed that they were showing their preference on the basis of the platform, but it wasn't that at all. They picked whoever the guy is that they like. And we use party as a shorthand for what we believe anyway. And I think that's fine, right? There's a basket of beliefs. And if you agree more or less with one or the other, you identify with the party. And you don't have to think about every single candidate every single time. You can, in fact, walk into a voting booth in places that they still have voting booths and click the party line. And it would just click, 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 click right down. I vote by mail. When I lived in Utah, literally every single person in the state voted by mail. In Arizona, everybody gets a ballot, but you can go vote in person if you want. And this is one of the things that everybody screams and yells about, right? that they're all convinced there's voter fraud when you vote by mail, but not when you vote in person. You can claim to be anybody you want when you go vote in person, and they'll fall for it almost every time. Very easy to commit voter fraud in person. Do you want to talk about voter ID? Yeah, sure. What do you think about voter ID? I love it. I think it's a great idea. In a self-governing republic, we should know that you cast your ballot. Now, the argument against voter ID is always the same. Democrats, very typically, and they say this as a group, there are very few who don't say this, say that it's racist, that it puts a barrier in between racial minorities and the voting booth. And we've got a long tradition of having a problem with that. We had the Jim Crow South, which kept blacks from voting after Reconstruction. So we're very sensitive to the assertion. I don't think the assertion holds any water at all, because in order for it to be correct, you have to assume that black people are somehow incapable of getting driver's licenses or state ID. Or checking accounts, right. You just have to make that assumption that somehow they're not smart enough to do this. You talk about YouTube videos. One of my favorite YouTube videos is some guy going up to black people asking them, can you get an ID to vote? And they'll say, yeah, like it's an idiotic question because it is. And then he says, but they say that you can't. And they say, why would they say that? And none of the people he asked had any idea. So I started replicating that. I just said, all right, I'm going to ask around and see. And I never had a single person in any city I've ever been to, and I've done this in Tucson, in New Orleans, in Chicago, and in Los Angeles, I've never had a single person say, no, I can't get an ID. Now, I didn't ask homeless guys, right? but homeless guys don't vote anyway. Mm -hmm. Let's just call it what it is. So, all right, there maybe are some people who don't have ID, but it's down to that level. And are we really looking at a voting problem? And I would submit, no, we're looking at a mental health problem. Right. There, it's a different kind of problem. So I want to go back to a question I posed earlier, and I mean it seriously. What's magical about 51%? What's magical about voting? The entire thing. What's the magic part? I don't get it. I don't see it. I see people working themselves up into a froth when I go to the polling station. It's one of the reasons why I stop going. I do it by mail every time. My entire family sits down. We knock it out. We yell at each other about who we're voting for. It's actually a lot of fun. My daughters are communists. They can't, <laughs> they, they can't, they can't help themselves. <laughs> One of the things that we talk about a lot in this country is the sacrosanctness of the majority. If the majority says this, then that's the way it should be. Everybody knows that's not true. Well, do we? I don't know. We say it so readily. Look, the majority once upon a time said, hey, let's have slaves. Yeah, see, that's the problem with relying so heavily on a majority. The majority could say all sorts of things. We have the Bill of Rights exactly to curtail the ability of majorities to do things. Right. The Bill of Rights exists to protect the minorities. Minorities, that's right. And thank God in a lot of ways. You guys might not know this. I didn't for a long time until I got to graduate school. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 84 said, we shouldn't even have a Bill of Rights. He said, if you have a Bill of Rights, you'll actually lose rights in the long run because people will all assume that the only ones you have are the ones that are listed, even though the ninth and 10th indicate that you have plenty of others. And he said, be careful, you don't want this. And then the anti-federalists at the time said, oh no, we want that. 
and you're going to have to add that for us to sign on to the Constitution. So the political bargain gets struck, and, and you know that that's how we get the Bill of Rights. But would we have been better off without it? Mm. You want to dismiss that possibility because it sounds so crazy. But Hamilton's not a crazy person. I mean, some people in our circle say that he is. Look, that was a smart guy who knew what he was talking about. And somebody as smart as him said, no, don't do it. I like the idea that my speech is protected, right? I speak for a living. I like that the government literally cannot shut me down, right? I can say all kinds of things, and there's nothing anybody in the government can do about it. What would my life have been like had that protection not been there? Well, I know this. The fifth Congress, so the first Congress passes the Bill of Rights. The fifth Congress, some of the same guys are in the room in the fifth Congress. They passed the Alien and Sedition Act, which, which says, if you speak out against the government, have a nice life in prison. Okay, I mean, that's where political people, that's their motivation, is to take your rights away. Our tendency is not to think in terms of the principle, but in terms of examples. So if the I... The immediate out. Yeah, if I show you an example of a corporation that spends a lot of money lobbying for something, and all of a sudden we all get incensed about this and say, well, it shouldn't be allowed to do that. And the Supreme Court says, no, this counts as speech. It's spending money to make people aware of this thing or whatever it is. And corporations have the right to free speech, which annoys all of us. That shouldn't be the case. Except we don't think through the principle. If we were to agree that companies should not have the same rights of free speech as people do, James and I wouldn't be standing right here. That's right. We have a company that handles our expenses and so forth, brings us here to talk to you. All of a sudden, we wouldn't be allowed to speak or we'd be regulated in some way. All of a sudden, what you intended for this one example gets applied in places you didn't want because you didn't think about the principle, you thought about the example. We each have our own company above and beyond working for other ones, right? Mm. And this is like a tax thing that you do when you get older and you've got income coming in from contracts and not jobs. My company is just called James Herrigan. Right. And yours is called Anthony Davies, right. right? And that's how we have to file our taxes. Do you really want to tell me that companies, corporations, don't have any kind of rights whatsoever? Because what the hell do I do now? I'm literally the only employee. And all I do is speak and write. And you see here now the benefit of the First Amendment. If we had left it to the majority, that decision would have gone the other way corporations would not have the right to free speech, and all of a sudden our free speech would be imperiled. But the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that because we have a constitutional amendment. The only way to overturn the constitutional amendment, it takes more than a simple majority. It takes another constitutional amendment. Yeah, it requires a supermajority. And what happened is it stands there protecting the rights of the minority from being overrun by the 51%. And thank God, because here's what actually would have happened. Whoever was in power when they figured out how to get around this problem would have absolutely beaten on their political opponents. Mm -hmm. Some years later, when those opponents won and the first group lost, we would have reversed the process. Right. And on and on and on through the years, kind of like happens now, when the new administration comes in and says, I do hereby overturn everything the last administration ever tried to do. And that would happen, we would flip-flop through the decades, and it would never stop. And we would learn that no minority is ever protected from a majority. So it's going to always be in your interest to try to get into the majority. Your whole life will be dedicated to that proposition. And if you're in a minority of any kind, and that's ideological or racial or literally anything, sexual, anything you can think of that divides human beings, your goal is going to be to be very quiet and not draw any attention to yourself because it's the nail that sticks up the furthest that gets pounded down first. That's majorities for you. Why do we look at voting in this sacrosanct way? Why all of a sudden are majorities so wonderful that we have to appeal to them and that they're the only thing that legitimizes anything? I want to come around now in another direction and argue that voting actually is really cool and it works really well. We tend to think of two areas, government where we vote and markets where we spend money. I argue that they're both voting mechanisms. In the market, you vote every time you buy something. You're voting with dollars. You're literally giving resources to this company that produced the product to keep producing it. 
in the same way that you go to the voting booth and you vote for this particular candidate so this candidate can gain office and do all sorts of things, I'm going to argue that the voting in the marketplace with the dollars is far superior to voting in a booth with the politicians. And here's why. Imagine how you order lunch. Some of you like hamburgers, some of you like pizza, and even amongst those of you who like hamburgers, James doesn't like onions, I like onions, he likes mayonnaise, I think it's gross, and we drink different things. And when you go and you order lunch, you vote with your dollars for the thing that is that you like. Now, have you ever heard of a broccoli hamburger? Probably not. Why? Nobody votes for it. Nobody's willing to put down their money for such a gross thing. Now, what you do hear about are all sorts of variations of the Wagyu beef and this and that hamburgers, right? Because we're willing to vote for those things. So the market gives us the things we vote for. And when we go and buy lunch, we all get these various things. Imagine if we did buying lunch the way we do politicians. What would happen is we get one vote each. No matter how hungry you are, no matter how much you have to spend, doesn't matter. Everybody gets one dollar you can put on whatever lunch is. And whatever gets 50% of the votes, that's what we all have. So if you people over there want pizza and we want hamburgers and you're more people than we are, it's too bad. We've got pizza. And furthermore, there's no variation. It's not like some of us can have cheese pizza and some of us can have pepperoni. It's one thing that wins and everybody gets it. Now, with the market voting, if you made a mistake, if you don't like the hamburger that you got, tomorrow you can buy a different one. With the voting thing, we ended up with pizza, we don't like pizza, it's okay, you can vote again in four years and get a different lunch. This is the problem of politics. In the end, we need stability. And we also need a regime that will respect our rights and make us happy. Now, having these two things together is phenomenally difficult. It's actually pretty easy to have stability. Every government has an army and every army can enforce stability. But that won't respect your rights or make anybody happy. That's always the tricky bit. And how do you accomplish that? We just get stuck because there's no easy answer. And I want you to maybe think of this when you think of voting. You're about the age where you can start voting. Just think of it in terms of the presidential election. So every four years, you're going to see a bunch of people get on a stage in the primaries, and they're going to say, we have this list of problems. And they're going to be right when they say that. They're going to be telling the truth. That list is always the same. It's Social Security, it's Medicare, it's foreign relations, right? The same list of things. And they're going to say, I know how to fix it. That's where the lying begins. That's the lie. I know how to fix it, and if you elect me, I'm going to do these things, and these things are going to be fixed. Well, every four years, we elect one of them. I don't care which, doesn't matter. And then, thus far, he doesn't solve the problems. How do I know? Four years later, a bunch of people on the stage talking about the same problems. It happens like clockwork. Now, if these problems were, in fact, soluble, we would have solved them. We don't want to have problems. We want to fix them. So there's something about Social Security that's just going to be a problem. Medicare, too. There's something about dealing with sovereign nations that causes us a lot of trouble. We won't fix these things because we can't. And you start to realize that politics, difficult though it is, is actually a process. It's a never-ending, churning process. It's not this discrete thing that happens every four years where we solve all our problems and then we wait for new ones to come. It's just the same day over and over and over again. Which one of you was I talking to over here and you asked me a question about the debt? Is the debt going to become a problem? Yeah. That question, how old are you, like 17? 18? I asked my teacher that same question when I was 18. <laughs> it was a problem then, it's a problem now. It's going to be a problem when your kid is 18. We've spent more money than we've taken in every year since 1956. So it's literally been a problem at least that far back. And here's an interesting thing. I talked to you earlier about politicians and said, look, think of them as businesses. They're looking to get your votes instead of your dollars and they're going to deliver things to you that you want, that make you mad, that cause you to get out and vote. Politicians actually, if you think of it that way, they have an incentive not to solve your problems. Because so long as the problem persists, and it made you mad enough this election to get up and vote, I don't want to solve it. Because it'll make you mad at the next election, and you'll get up and vote again. 
What I do want you to think is that I'm out there working for you to solve the problem, despite the fact that the problem is not getting solved. And there is actually one way that you can get politicians to do something. We tend not to bother because it's hard and it takes a lot of time and you have to dedicate yourself to the proposition and then you have to get a bunch of other people to do it too. You have to care about voting because they care about voting, but then you have to also care about their behavior after the voting. Right, you have to pay attention. If that happens, there are some examples that we can point to and they tend to hit voting again, so it's not exactly clear. The, the best example, I think, is Bill Clinton, who you know won the presidency, didn't win it by a landslide, but won it. And there was no doubt about the legitimacy of the election. People weren't whining about that the way they do now. So Bill Clinton starts being president. And he's got some troubles, lady troubles. He does some things. He gets caught. There's just problems. And in the midterm elections, he gets slaughtered. There are more Republicans elected to Congress in the election of, what was it, 94, than had ever been elected ever. It was the first Republicans ever to win in the South since the Civil War, right? It's that kind of thing. And Bill Clinton looked at that and he said, my entire party just disappeared. And then he did what every smart politician does and what you should remember. He said, how can I work with the other ones? I got to do something. How can I deal with them? If you remember that politicians do, in fact, do that, then you can manipulate them. Because if you can convince them that they're going to have to pay a price if they don't pay attention to you, they will absolutely pay attention to you. It's just a matter of how pervasive can you make it. Right. You can call a congressman's office and get them to do things for you. That's their job. They do it all the time. You call them and say, look, I'm having trouble. My grandmother's not getting her Social Security check. Somebody from that office will chase it down. You'll have it by the end of the week. That's what they're for. There are people in the office dedicated to what they call constituent service. Most people don't know this because they think politicians just do nothing. And they're largely right, but they're only largely right. So how is it that you can leverage that? And every now and then you can to the extent that you can actually get your fellow citizens interested in something that's not just checking off a vote, now you actually have something. The voting is a necessary precondition. It's necessary but insufficient. That second part is the part that has all the magic, and it's the part that we hardly ever use. So if you want to see the good part of it, that's where you'll find it. Thank you so much Thank you. for hanging out with us today. It was really a lot of fun. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, Words and Numbers Podcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows? It may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried. You tried, that's right. Till next week, can't take it easy. See you next week, James.